Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to our studios. And with me here is my dear brother Sam Shimon. Mm. And today's live stream is going to be a little bit unique, like we did it before. I think one time at least we did this. This is going to be a combination of Facebook Live and also my radio show, Let Us Reason. Because of this, we are going to only do uh, the first part for about uh, around 24 minutes, give or take. So you'll hear me talking to my radio audience and around 24 minutes from now, I'll stop the recording. We'll take a one minute break. You might see us, you know, in the studio and then we'll come back and do another radio show for another 24 minutes or so. So that's why you're going to hear me talking uh, to both audience, Facebook audience and also our radio audience. So to those of you who are tuning in to Let Us Reason, I'd like to welcome you to this special episode of Let Us Reason that is also aired right now on Facebook and you can go to my Facebook basically page alfadi.sira to watch it whether if you are uh, you know listening to this recording at that moment you can go of course and watch it it's been recorded on December 18th so you can go to the post on December 18th and you'll be able to see this with me here in the studio again is our dear brother Sam Shamon. And today's really uh, part one and also later part two is very special in terms of the topic and the focus. We are going to talk about a very interesting topic called Christology. Mm. And that deals, of course, with the deity of Christ. And we are going to show that the deity of Christ is very evident even in the Gospel of Mark. Why yep. do I say this? Because we get accused all the time that it's only John that talks about Christ as God or as divine, that somehow there has been an evolution uh, in, uh, in the writings of the Gospels or between the writers of the Gospels that somehow Mark started with the humanity of Jesus and John ended uh, writing about Jesus as a divine person. Welcome, brother, and I'm always blessed to have you here. It's a blessing to serve you and serve with you for the glory of Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> as our habit is, we invoke Jesus Christ our Lord to bless this session for his glory, fill us with the Holy Spirit, save us from error, and speak truth passionately so that the church will be strengthened and Muslims will be convicted to repent and fall in love with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, their only hope of salvation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. We need you. We depend on you. Amen. It's all right. So, um, what can we learn about the Christology of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark alone? Yeah, and when we say Christology, obviously, uh, we want to define some terms. Christology means the study of Christ. <clears throat> The reason why we're focusing on the Gospel of Mark is because Muslims have picked up on the dating that not only liberal, but even evangelical scholars <clears throat> assign to the writing of the Gospels. Most scholars believe that Mark is the first of the four Gospels and that John is the last. Now, again, that is an assumption, and some people say there are strong reasons for that assumption. I'm not going to try to challenge the dating and say, well, Mark is not the first, but let's say Matthew. We're just going to, for argument's sake, assume Mark is the first. And we're going to show from Mark that the portrait of Mark <clears throat> in regards to Jesus is that Jesus is not a mere human creature or an angelic creature, but that he's God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit. Now, why is that important? Amen. Because the Muslims will tell you, see, it's only in John where you find these highly exalted claims of deity. But in Mark, Jesus speaks as a super, supernaturally empowered servant messenger, no more, no less. That's so right. that's why it's vitally important that as serious students of the Bible, people who love the triune God, who love the Bible as God's word, they need to be able to demonstrate from all the Gospels, sp right. specifically and especially, particularly the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus, even in Mark, is God in the flesh and claimed to be such. Amen. Amen. So, so walk us through <clears throat> some of these powerful passages yes. in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to start with the very first chapter. You Mark know, chapter are 1. Are you saying from the beginning? Yes. Mark chapter 1. We're going to try to break it down with the time allotted to us, but we're going to do two sessions. So Lord willing, if we don't get to all of it, we can at least pick it up in the second session because we want to open up for Q&A as well. Amen. If the people have questions, feel free to ask us. This is the time for you to ask. Yes, please. It says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, now Mark is telling us that this gospel that I'm now setting forth, that I'm writing down, and we believe by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has already been prophesied in the prophets, in the writings of the Old Testament. Old Testament. Old Testament, centuries before these events. The prophets by revelation of the Holy Spirit announced these events. Now.
It is of interest that the two passages that he cites are passages about the coming of the God of the Old Testament. <clears throat> yeah, and not just a person, no, no. God himself. <clears throat> the God of the Old Testament coming after sending a, a herald, an emissary to prepare for his coming. So let's read it. As, as it is written in the prophets, look, <clears throat> I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now let me unpack these two Old Testament prophecies. The first is Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, this is what the prophet said will take place. I will send my messenger. This is a citation from Malachi 3 1. I, God speaking, will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me or before my face. And the Lord whom you seek the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. He is coming, says Yahweh or Yahovah of hosts. Now notice who's coming. God says, I'm going to send a messenger ahead of me to prepare for, for my face, to prepare right. people for my coming. And that's John the Baptist. And now he says, when this messenger comes, immediately after him, the Lord will show up in his temple. Now, the, the words, the Lord in Hebrew is Ha-Adan. I don't want people to take my word for it, get any lexical source, and if you can read the Hebrew, read it for yourself. It's Ha-Adan. That exact phrase, Ha, the definite article, and Adan, is never used for anyone besides Yehovah, the true God. Amen. And you'll find one of its occurrences in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24, just to name a few, Isaiah 1, 24, and Isaiah 3, 1. There, it's Yehovah of hosts, Jehovah of hosts, called the Lord Ha'adan. It's never used of anyone but the true God. By the way, Ha'adan is where we get also Adonai. Adonai, Adoni, yeah. Yeah. right? Adonai, all, all the, it all comes from Adan. That's right. Which can mean Lord, Master, but in this particular context, it's speaking of God as the Lord who's Identify coming to with his it, with temple. Definite article. So the second proof that right. this being who's coming is not a creature but is God, it says that the Lord will come to his temple. Right. Now you don't need to guess whose temple this is because if you go to first chronicles 29 verse 1 david is telling the people to help solomon in the building of the temple in jerusalem because he says this palace is not for man but for god amen so the temple in jerusalem is for who is it for, for a man god, god almighty and the jews got upset with jesus <clears throat> when he was talking about the temple as it belongs to him his body but now in right. malachi son about the temple in jerusalem the lord is going to appear there the Lord is going to appear in that temple in Jerusalem. Now, which temple? Malachi is talking about the second temple because the first temple had been destroyed. But the principle is the same. The temple in Jerusalem, that physical building, was not built for man. First Chronicles 29, verse 1, but for God. So it says the Lord will come to his temple. Amen. A messenger will be sent. After the messenger comes, the Lord will show up in his temple. Clearly, this is Jehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh coming to Jerusalem and entering his temple. The second confirmation that Mark gives that this is God coming, not a creature, Mark then quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. That's now, the Mark the evangelist right yes. now we're talking about. Because yeah. in Mark chapter 1, yeah. he quoted two Old Testament texts. He quoted Malachi 3, 1, which we just unpacked. Clearly, that's God coming once the messenger prepares for his coming. The second citation is just as clear. In fact, some would say even clearer because it tells us who's coming in explicit terms, Yahovah, Yahweh, Jehovah, however you want to pronounce the divine name. Let's read it. This is what he quotes. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him who cries out, the voice of him who cries out, prepare the way of the Lord. In Hebrew, Yod, He, Vav, He, where we get the divine name. Some pronounce it Yahovah, some Jehovah, Yahweh, whoever want to pronounce it, it is God. Prepare the way for Jehovah, for the Lord, for God. And where? In the wilderness. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Notice the highway for whom? <clears throat> our God. Amen. So a voice will be heard, a voice in the wilderness, in the desert, shouting out, preparing people for the coming of Jehovah, Amen. Yahweh. Amen. And that's the same voice that's said to be the messenger of Malachi, sent to prepare people for the coming of the Lord who will enter his temple. According to Mark, that messenger sent to prepare for the Lord, the voice in the wilderness that cries out, get ready for the coming of Yahweh, 
Amen. is John the Baptist. Amen. In and fact, by the way, thank you, James Lawson, for uh, writing all of these <coughs> passages, and Anne Ryan also, so people can track as well. Yes. Yeah. Now, coming back to the point, so that I don't lose the audience, and I hope I'm not losing you, let me know if we're losing you in the comment section. Two prophecies saying that a an, an herald, an emissary, <clears throat> a messenger, will be sent in the wilderness to prepare people for the coming of Ha'adan, the Lord, to his temple. Yehovah, the Lord Jehovah, is coming. Once this entity, this, this herald comes to prepare for his coming, announcing to the people. According to Mark 1, that voice in the wilderness, that messenger sent to prepare for the appearance of God, is none other than John the Baptist. And I'm going to go to Mark 1 again. I'm going to reread 3 and put it with 4 so you can see the connection. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Which in the Hebrew would be prepare the way of Yahweh. Yahovah. Amen. Make his path straight. This voice will be heard in the wilderness. Now is it a coincidence in verse 4... We are told by Mark, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So notice John's voice is heard in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness and he's preparing people for the coming of what these Old Testament prophecies say, Jehovah Almighty, the Lord Almighty to his temple. And where was John? <clears throat> what do you mean, John? John was, the Baptist. Where was he baptizing? He was across the Jordan. That's and there's right. a reason why the Holy Spirit said that, because that's the wilderness right there before entering into the promised land. Well, it even land. says it in 4, John came baptizing yeah. in the wilderness. Amen. You guys catching it? You don't need to guess where he is. Notice the verse, folks. It says, in the wilderness. Why in the wilderness? Did you remember the prophecy in Isaiah 40? That's right. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. So who is it? You don't need to guess. Verse 4, that's John. He's the voice. He's the messenger. But who did John prepare for? Let's read to 8. The whole region of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River. So we're reading now 5 to 8. John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Now notice what he says. He preached saying, after me is coming one mightier than I. The straps of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, let me explain what that means. It was the function of household servants, servants right. in the house, to provide water for travelers or even for the owner of the house because at that time, they would wear open sandals and be walking on dusty roads. Right. So when you enter the home, the servant would come with water, untie your sandals, and wash your feet. So what John is saying is, he is so great and mighty, I'm not good enough to be his slave. That's right. I am not worthy to touch his sandals. I'm not good enough to be a slave. That's how mighty he is. And then he puts the icing on the cake. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So notice, how great is this one? So great that I'm unworthy to be a slave. I, he's too good for me, and I'm not good enough to be his slave. And he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. I challenge any anti-Trinitarian. I challenge a Muslim. I'll even let him use his Quran. I'll even let him use the Quran, which is not the Word of God. I challenge any of you listening now, and this is a live stream, so hopefully you'll bring, bring me your objection. Show me a single place in the Hebrew Scriptures. And show me a place in the Quran where someone other than the true God grants the Holy Spirit, immerses people in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, pours off the Holy Spirit. You won't find it. That's a function of God alone. But John says, this one who comes... He will immerse you, baptize Amen. you with, in the Holy Spirit, something the Old Testament agrees is a prerogative of God alone. And I'll just give you one example. Joel 2, 28 to 29. And, I, and it will be that afterwards, I, God speaking, Yehovah, will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men and will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the men servants and maid servants. In those days, I, Yahovah, will pour out my spirit. Now, could Mark be any clearer Amen. in saying that this Jesus is the Lord Ha'adan of Malachi 3.1, who's coming to his temple, who's, by the way, called the Angel of the Covenant, meaning he is that figure in the Old Testament called the Messenger of God, who's distinct from God and happens to be God. 
Could it be any clearer that this Jesus is Yahovah, whom the voice in the wilderness was sent to announce and herald his coming? So Mark has begun his gospel by telling you, this is the divine son who's distinct from the father because he's the son of God, the father, but he's one with the father in essence because he is that very God of the Old Testament to whom the temple in Jerusalem belongs. He is that God in the flesh that John sent to prepare. Amen. And if you're tuning in to Let Us Reason, <coughs> um, this is uh, another podcast that, that we are doing uh, as a special edition where the same podcast is being aired right now on Facebook Live. If you want to go and watch the entire thing on video, if you have access to Facebook, it is uh, posted on December 18th, 2019. And later on, we will see if we can make it even available as well as one of the video videos on our YouTube channel, Sierra International. Now, um, we've been going through the topic of Christology from the Gospel of Mark, yes. and the reason why we chose this, and with me here is Sam Shimon, our guest, uh, because there is always an attack against the deity of Christ and the claim that only the Gospel of John amplified the deity of Christ, where in fact the other Gospels did not. And we are showing that traditionally, at least, it's perceived that the Gospel of Mark is either the earlier or one of the earliest to be written. And yet we're showing from chapter 1 the deity of Christ, sure. as our dear brother <clears throat> here have quoted a number of those passages. Keep yep. going, brother. Yes, and because we're going to open up also for oh, for without it, but let me just at least... We might take a few minutes yeah. and then allow people yeah, to Yeah, we're going to do another live right after this, so I'm going to try to get as much meat as possible, but this time I'm going to do Mark 2 in the second session, God willing, because I want to go to Mark 12 in the parable of the vineyard. Jesus describes Israel as a vineyard planted by God. This is Mark 12, read verses 1 to 9. You can read all the way to 12 if you guys want to, but I'm going to just read Mark 12, verses 1 to 9, specifically 6 to 9, because there, God, uh, God is likened to an owner of, the, of a vineyard. The vineyard is Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7 says, the vineyard is Israel, Jerusalem. And then God, the owner of the vineyard, rents it out to tenants. The tenants are the religious establishment. In the parable, Jesus says that the owner sends servants to collect the fruit from the vineyard, and the tenants send him away. They beat another, stone another, and kill another. So notice, the owner of the vineyard sends servants to the tenants because they don't own the vineyard. They're supposed to manage it. The tenants are supposed to be the religious establishment, but they keep mistreating the servants of God, killing some of them. So now notice who Jesus thinks he is in relation to the owner. What is Jesus' role in relationship to the owner in contrast to the servants? Speaking of himself in the parable, Mark 12, 6 to 8. Having yet, having yet his one well-beloved son, having one well-beloved son, not many, contrast to the servants, this one is the only son, beloved, dear to his heart. He sent him last to them, saying, they will revere my son. They'll re reverence my son because they're going to know he's not just a servant. He's my son. He's my heart. He's my beloved. But those vine dressers, the tenants, said among themselves, this is the heir, pay attention, heir. He's the heir of the owner. Whatever the owner owns, the son possesses. The owner's possessions are the possession of the son. He owns everything that belongs to the owner. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now let's unpack the implication of this. The servants, according to the Old Testament, are the prophets. And I'm just going to give you, give you a couple examples that the servants in Jesus' parable, he's narrating Old Testament history, how the religious establishment, the powers that be, treated the servants of God and how they're going to treat him, the beloved son of God. They're going to kill me. But now let me prove to you that the servants are prophets. Jeremiah 7, 25. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have even sent to you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. So Jeremiah 7, 25. Jeremiah 26, verse 5. Jeremiah 29, 19. 29, 19. Jeremiah 44, verse 4. And Revelation eleven eighteen. 18. All say the servants are the prophets that God sent to Israel, whom the religious authority persecuted and some killed. But notice who Jesus thinks he is. I'm not simply a servant like them. So much for Islamic theology. I'm not a servant like them. I am greater than them because I am the son, the owner's son, the son of the owner. Unlike them, I am his son. <clears throat> I belong to him and all that he owns is mine. 
Whatever he owns belongs to me. Now, folks, let me unpack what that means. The vineyard is Jerusalem, and the owner is God. So God owns Jerusalem, and by extension, he owns the world. And the servants belong to the owner. So God is the owner of the prophets, the Lord of the prophets. He is over the prophets. But Jesus said, guess what? I am his beloved son, the son he loves, and I am his heir. Whatever belongs to him is mine. I own everything he owns. That means I own Jerusalem, and the prophets are my servants too. I own them. Amen. How in the world can you take this parable and walk away with the assumption that Jesus thinks he's just a prophet like the rest of the prophets when he's higher than them, greater than them, better than them, and the heir, and the icing on the cake. One of the 99 names of Allah in Islamic theology, and it's based on Quranic passages, such as chapter 15, verse 23 of the Quran, chapter 15, verse 23, chapter 19, verse 40 of the Quran, chapter 19, verse 80, chapter 15, verse 23, chapter 19, verse 40, chapter 19, verse 80, one of the names of Allah is Al-Warith, the heir. Right. In the Quran, Allah says, we are the inheritors. We are the heirs. Jesus just claimed for himself the title heir. I am the heir. Something that the Quran admits is a title belonging only to true deity, to God. Amen. And of course, I mean, I love, you know, you wrote at least a couple of articles on the idea that God, uh, Allah in the Quran is the heir because, you know, some try to refute uh, the idea that the fact that Jesus is the heir does not make him divine. So you basically turn the, their attention to the Quran and, and use that exactly. So thank you, by the way, uh, to those who have uh, joined us or tuned in to Let Us Reason. As we mentioned earlier, this is a special edition. It's being aired right now also on Facebook Live. Of course, when you listen to it, it would have been like probably weeks ago. Uh, but if you want to go and watch this live stream, go to Facebook. Uh, our Facebook page, alfadi.sira, and then scroll down to the post for December 18th, 2019, and you'll be able to come across this particular podcast, which we're going to uh, label it basically the, Christolo uh, the Christology of Mark. And so far, we have really not unpacked a whole lot nope, yet. I mean, we just started with chapter one and we just gave a flavor from chapter 12 and we tied it to the Old Testament, of course, with me here, my dear brother and guest, Sam Shimon. Now we have two minutes left before we close this podcast. So uh, like I said, uh, stay tuned because we will continue after a pause for about a minute to do part two, which is week uh, two of this particular series. And we want you to know that this is just a teaser. We will sometimes in the near future, maybe next year, me and Sam will do a whole series on Christology from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. So this is just a teaser. And by the way, we've done amazing work so far on the Trinity from the Old Testament. And we will announce to you once these videos become available pretty soon. As always, I remind you to go and subscribe to our uh, basically YouTube channel, Sira International. Become a Patreon patron, and I pray that you would give as much as the Lord put in your heart. And I encourage you also to do the same with my brother. Where can they go and subscribe, yes. brother, before we wrap? Yeah, well, they can look for me on Patreon under the name Shamunian. S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. My Patreon account is attached to that name, Shamunian. And my YouTube account is Shimonian, and God willing, in the future, I may change the name, but for now, that's where they can find me. Amen. So please, we encourage you uh, to consider doing something like that because we are dependent, of course, on the Lord and his provision through faithful givers like yourself. And what we love about Patreon is that it's consistent. Yes. And you can give as little, believe it or not, as little as $1 uh, and whatever the Lord put in your heart. Helps. So all of that, maybe it's $1 for you, as you heard from my brother, but it does help us in staying on air and doing these video projects that we receive a lot of really compliments about. So thank you so much for your prayers, partnership, and faithfulness. And until we meet again next week, God bless you. Okay, so folks, you're watching me right now. We're going to take a pause for about a minute. You can stay on air. I haven't seen, by the way, any questions yet. We've That's seen right. a lot of comments, uh, but maybe I missed something. However, this second part right now will continue with the Christology of Mark, but we probably will start interacting with some of your questions. So please begin to think yep. about questions and send them to us. So you're going to keep it live with them on Facebook, or are you stopping it? No, no, we're, we're keeping it live oh, right okay, now. Yeah. All right, so. come on, folks. Yeah. Get them in questions. Stop me. Stump the chump. Yeah.
What's that? Ready to go. All right, so we are ready to go for part two right now. So right. Uh, let's let's do it whenever uh, the team gives me the thumbs up. Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to a special edition of Let Us Reason, which is also aired as we speak right now on Facebook Live. And this one will be posted on our Facebook page, alfadi.sira, on December 18, 2019. Now, this is part two of what we titled the Christology of Mark, and the reason why we wanted to focus on Mark and the deity of Christ in Mark, because of the usual attacks against the, uh, basically the divinity of Christ and the claim that only in the Gospel of John you mm -hmm. will be able to claim that Jesus is divine. Outside of that, none of the Synoptic Gospels basically dealt with the divinity of Christ, which is a, an utterly false statement. But we are focusing right now only on Mark, and this is just a teaser, as I mentioned uh, in the last episode. Uh, me and my dear brother here, Sam Shamon, who's with me in the studio, are going just to give you a flavor of some of the powerful passages that you can find in the Gospel of Mark about the deity of Christ. However, later on, Lord willing, maybe even uh, next year in 2020, we will do a whole video series on the Christology of Christ, not only from Mark, but also from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. Welcome back, brother, yep. <clears throat> and uh, I'll turn it over to you so you can continue with your teaching. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. We trust Jesus Christ and anoint us again by the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus, our Lord. He is worthy. We love you, Son of God. Now, to continue where we left off in the previous <clears throat> program, I'm going to give some more additional proof that the Mark in Jesus, the Jesus of Mark, who's the Jesus of history, claimed to be God in the flesh, and Mark presents him as God in the flesh, though he's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to go to my third example, <clears throat> Mark chapter 2. It's verses 1 to 12, but we're going to start at 5. A group of uh, folks bring a paralytic right. who is bedridden. They bring him on his pallet, on his mat, because they believe that Jesus can heal him. Now, there's they can't enter through the front door because it's crowded, so they make a hole in the roof and lower bring down, down, lower down the, the pallet, the mat. Jesus sees it. So that's where we're picking it up. Now pay attention to the language of the text, folks. Pay attention to what our Lord says when he sees it. Again, you can go to Mark <clears throat> chapter 2 and start reading from the that's beginning. Right. Reading from 5 to 12. When Jesus saw their faith, saw their faith, meaning he saw the actions, the fruit of their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. Now notice, they're not thinking this verbally. They're saying it within themselves, in their hearts. Why does this man speak such blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God, God alone? Now, ironically, the Quran agrees, because in chapter 3, verse 135, chapter 3, verse 135, notice what it says. Who, when they commit an indecency or wrong themselves, remember God and pray forgiveness for their sins. And who shall forgive sins but God? Amen. And do not be, So the Quran persevere. acknowledges that yeah, only God has that sense, divine, but, basically, But advocate. God, and do not persevere in the things they did and that wittingly. So the, it's agreement. Only God can forgive. Now, Jesus doesn't correct them saying, look, I'm a messenger. I'm simply announcing that God is forgiven. I'm relaying what God told me he's forgiven. No, no, no. Watch what Jesus says. Immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit, side note, this is Mark's way of referring to the divine nature of Christ. When he says in his spirit, he's distinguishing Jesus' flesh, meaning his humanity, from his divine nature, which he says spirit. So immediately as God, being God in the flesh, as God, in respect to his divine nature, i.e. in his spirit, Jesus knew that they so reasoned within themselves, and he said to them, why do you contemplate these things in your hearts? So he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. They didn't verbalize this. That's right. I mean, he knew what was going on in the inside. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Well, to ask the question is answered. I can say to someone, you're forgiven all day, all night. You can't prove or disprove it. But if someone is sick and I say, be healed, and if he doesn't get healed, I'm exposed as a fraud, as a charlatan. But now notice what Jesus goes on to say. But that you may know, I mean, have no doubt. It's not simply the Father pronouncing forgiveness. That the Son of Man, I, the Son of Man, have authority on earth to forgive sins. I do have this ability to forgive sins. <clears throat> he said to the paralytic, 
I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go your way to your house. Immediately he rose, picked up the bed, and went out in front of them all. So Jesus healed this man's disease to prove that he can forgive sins, which is something only God can do. And Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Now, why is this astonishing? You need to read Mark in the back, backdrop of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Notice what the following Old Testament passages teach. 1 Kings 18.39. 1 Kings 18.39. When all the people saw it, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 1 Kings 8.39. Okay. You, Solomon, praying, hear from heaven, forgive. 1 Kings 8.39. Forgive <clears throat> their sins, for you know what's in the hearts of the sons of men. Only you know their hearts. That's right. Do you know what 1 Kings 8.39 said? You know the hearts of the sons of men, and only you know their hearts. And who's the you? Yahweh. Yahweh, because you hear from heaven, forgive. Notice, forgive what Jesus did, and you know what's in their hearts, and only you know what's in the hearts of the sons of men. 1 Kings 8, 39. That's one. Psalm 44, 21. Would not God search this out? Would he not be aware of what you're doing, that you're trying to hide stuff? For he knows the secrets of the heart. And according to Solomon, only he and he alone knows what's in the hearts of the sons of men. But it gets even better. It's all good. But now notice this one. Jesus knew what was in their hearts immediately. He healed the man his disease and forgave his sins, and he redeems us from the pit. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Bless Yehovah. Bless the Lord. Bless Jehovah. Not a creature. Bless God for who he is and for what he does. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Bless him for forgiving all your iniquities. Bless him who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. So notice, it is God, the true God, Yahovah, who heals all our diseases, who forgives all our sins, who redeems us from the pit, who alone knows all the hearts of the sons of men, all of which was just described to Jesus and Mark by Jesus himself. And Mark 10, 45, about redeeming from the pit, Jesus speaking, Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, <clears throat> but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus will offer his soul to ransom many, to redeem us from the pit, forgives all our sins, heals all our diseases, and knows what's in the hearts of men. Amen. And what I want to wow. add also uh, to what Sam, uh, you know, uh, amazingly have mentioned, of course, is that Jesus also, uh, many commentators will say something like that, that the worldview of the people at that time is that when someone was born this way or is inflicted with such a disease, that means this person is, is a sinner or under the judgment of God. So Jesus was basically using their worldview against him and say, okay, so you think he's a sinner and he is under the judgment of God. That's fine. I just forgave his sin. Let me prove to you that his sins are forgiven. He's healed. He can walk now. There, therefore, there is no more... Uh, judgment uh, against him. And of course, if you go to John 9, you'll see that even the apostles thought that the blind man was blind simply because he's either he sinned or his parents have sinned. Right. Now, of course, if you're tuning in, this is Let Us Reason, and <clears throat> maybe you'll wonder where can you go and listen to previous episodes of this uh, radio show. You can go to our website, sirainternational.com. That's C as in Charlie, C-I-R-A, sirainternational.com. And we have an entire section in there that's called Let Us Reason. You click on it and it takes you back all the way to the first, basically, episode in October 4th, 2014. Yes, you heard me. It's, all, it's, all, it's been over five years mm -hmm. now. So you can go and listen oh, yeah. to all of that. And I've done a number of shows with my dear brother Sam here, and you'll be able to see those as well. And we do our best to give titles for each one of those episodes. Okay, right. Sam. Well, uh, okay. what else can uh, you share with, uh, oh, with us about uh, the Christology uh, from Mark? Mark, and notice we're just scratching the surface because there's too much. We're trying to give the most salient examples because of the time allotted to us. So let me go to Mark 12, 29 to 30, because this is often quoted out of context by Muslims and anti-Trinitarian Unitarians to try to disprove that Jesus is God. Mark 12, 29 to 30, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? He says, <clears throat> the, Jesus answered him, Mark 12, 29, 30, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, the Greek word for Lord, because Mark is writing in Greek, it's kyrios. Some will pronounce it kurios, the Rasmin way. I don't care how you pronounce it. I have a hard time speaking English. Oh, by the way, we got somebody who was really upset with you saying this, so they uh, wanted you to know that this is how you pronounce it. Which uh, where, where, Well, I deleted their comment. They because, can say what they want. Because, because usually I laugh at those kind of comments. Yeah, because if I get yeah. a gr native Greek speaker, 
Yeah. And he hears a, a New Testament professor saying, oh, kurios mu, he's going to laugh. They'll say, that's not Greek. So they'll say, o, o kurios mu. Well, how do you know how the ancient Greeks yeah. anyway pronounce it? Right, but so. be that as it may, you want to pronounce it kurios or kurios. The point is the Greek word is going to be the same. Open up Mark in the Greek, because Mark is written in Greek. It's the same word for Lord in these examples. That's all I'm trying to emphasize. Okay, so he says, the Lord our God is one Lord. So Israel, now David is an Israelite, right? Because yeah. when he says, hero Israel, the Lord our God right. is one, one Lord. So that would include David. So David knows he has only one Lord, and that one Lord is his God, correct? That's okay. Right. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, this is often quoted. You have Muslim polemicists quoting this out of context to make it say something it doesn't. They don't read what follows because it is not a coincidence, Christians. Pay attention to this. That right after Jesus says, the greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, and strength, mind, love your neighbor as yourself. He then goes right away to quote another Old Testament citation to prove that the is Israelites one Lord. The one Lord of Israel is multi-personal. What am I talking about? Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35, 37. While Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? Muslims, Christians agree. Christ is Jesus. Jesus is Christ. But he's trying to ask them a question to see that the Christ is more than a human descendant of David. How much more? He's David's God. Now, how's he going to show them that? Well, he asked them the question. You're saying Christ is the son of David, right? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, Side note, Jesus confirms the divine inspiration of David's writings. He says, David wrote these Psalms by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit taught David what to, to say, inspired David to write these, thongs, uh, these things down, and revealed things to David. David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord, and the Greek, it's the same word, folks. That's why I say, open up your Greek New Testament. It's kurios or kurios. The kurios, the Lord, said to my Lord, the Lord said to my, David speaking, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus goes on to say, David himself calls the Messiah, the Christ, Lord. How then is he a son? And the large crowd heard him gladly. Folks, did you hear what Jesus just said? David, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit revealed to David, the Christ who Jesus is Lord and his Lord and the Christ, David's Lord, was told by the Lord to sit at his right hand in heaven. So let's unpack that. You have two here called Lord, and the Greek word is the same. It's the same in the Greek. Both of them are called uh, kyrios or kurios. They're both called Lord, same word in Greek. One Lord says to the other Lord, sit at my right hand. And, and God says <clears throat> that this one sitting at my right hand will remain at my right hand until his enemies are made his footstool. Jesus says, David was speaking of Messiah, the Christ, as his Lord sitting at the right hand of the Lord until Messiah's enemies are vanquished. Now, here's the problem. Jesus just got done saying that an Israelite only has one Lord. Israel's God is their one Lord. Their one Lord is their God. Their God is their one Lord. One Lord, and that's their God, who is Yahovah. But then Jesus says, David called Messiah Lord and called Messiah his Lord who is enthroned in heaven. Now, why do I keep saying heaven? Because in Psalm 103, verse 19, Psalm 103, verse 19, Psalm chapter 2, verse 4, Psalm 2, verse 4, Psalm 11, verse 4, Psalm chapter 11, verse 4, it says that Jehovah, Yahweh, sits enthroned in heaven. Just to read one for the sake of time. Psalm 103, 19. The Lord, Yahovah, Yahweh, has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Now, folks, don't take my word for it. There's not a single place in the entire Old Testament where someone other than Yahweh sits enthroned in heaven. Yeah. Yahweh Amen. and Yahweh alone sits on heaven's throne and the only Lord that an Israelite has in heaven, not talking about earthly lords. He can be my earthly Lord and I be his slave but there's only one in heaven that can be the Lord on the throne and the Lord of Israel, and that's Jehovah, that's Yahweh. But I'm confused now. You have Yahweh on the throne, the Messiah, who's also on the throne in heaven, and he's David's Lord in heaven. 
If Jesus is a creature, utter blasphemy because you cannot have more than one Lord ruling in heaven if you're an Israelite. Let me repeat, and I'm challenging right. anti-Trinitarians to refute me. You cannot have more than one Lord sitting enthroned in heaven. There's only one in heaven enthroned as Israel's, lo Israel's Lord, and it's Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahovah. But Jesus said, David acknowledges two, Jehovah and the Messiah, David's Lord, both of whom reign on the same throne in heaven as Lord over God's people. Amen. This would be blasphemy if the Messiah Jesus is a creature, but if he's divine, if he's God in the flesh, distinct from the Father, one with him, then it makes perfect sense. There is no blasphemy. Amen. And also, I love even that count, the same account that you just mentioned in Matthew uh, chapter 22, uh, basically verses 40 to 44, where Jesus even uh, mentions that David by the Spirit. Yes, same thing. You know, so now we, because we're talking about uh, God who is one. but Yeah, and is... like Mark 12, 36, David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit. So let's do the math. Good. Amen. Here, Amen. David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit. So you have Jehovah, Yahweh, yep. speaking to David's Lord, who is the Messiah. Right. Telling him to sit with me on heaven's throne. And David knew this by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, wow. next, next time I hear a Muslim to tell, uh, tell me about John 17, 3, I'd like you to go ahead and, and read this first. Yes, uh, and three, right? To, yep. I'm exactly. hoping the camera's on me now. Notice, three. Yeah. Yahweh, David's Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Three, right? Amen. And they're telling me, no, the Bible doesn't teach a trinity. Now, you know why this is a nightmare for the Muslim? Because in chapter 3, verses 79 to 80, let me read chapter 3, verses 79 to 80. Why what Jesus said about David shows that Muhammad is a false prophet, the Quran is a false book. Chapter 3, verses 79 to 80. It belongs not to any man, mortal. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 79 to 80. It belongs not to any mortal that God should give him the book, the judgment, and prophet. Then he should say to men, Be you servants to me, my servants, apart from God. Rather, he'll say, Be you teachers, in that you know the book and in that you study, he would never order you to take the angels and prophets as lords. What, would he order you to disbelief after you sur surrendered? Now, Muslims, you have a problem. Jesus says the prophet David was told by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophet David that Messiah Jesus, because we both agree Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, he is David's Lord, ruling in heaven, on the throne of God, over all creation, Something the Quran says could not happen, cannot be true, but it is true. So either that means the Quran is wrong, which it is, and Muhammad is a false prophet, or you're going to have to admit that the Messiah is more than a human being. He is God in the flesh and therefore worthy to sit on the throne with the Father in heaven as Israel's one Lord and the Lord of all creation. But then that would still mean Muhammad is a false prophet. And it's chapter 3 of the Quran. Verses 79 to 80. Chapter 3, verses 79 to 80. Yeah. Thanks, James, uh, for doing this. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dan Japan. You know yourself. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, you know, of course, if you're tuning in, this is Let Us Reason. And again, like I said, this is a special edition of our radio show, Let Us Reason. Of course, you can always go to our website, sirainternational.com, and listen to this. And this will be aired uh, basically sometimes in February and possibly the beginning of March. But you can also go to our Facebook page, alfadi.sira, and go to the post on December 18th, 2019, and you'll be able to watch it as well. So either way, this is part of the Let Us Reason, basically, podcast. And the title of the previous episode on this one is The Christology of Mark. And the reason why we chose The Christology of Mark, simply because we're always attacked by the mere fact that somehow, outside of the Gospel of John, Jesus cannot be divine. And I think we have proved that this argument is ridiculous, to say the least. That's right. Now, we have a few minutes left, sure. about maybe six minutes or so before we wrap this up. In fact, we have about four minutes before I start wrapping up. So we need you to start sending us questions yeah, if, if you, you have, have any. any. And let's scroll all the way top to see if anyone yes. have left us any questions. No, we have no, a lot no. of comments by the way i think we have uh, let me tell you how many comments so far we have well yeah. praise the lord we have 127 comments thank you so much everyone yep, of course people. but but this is really your chance you know i have sam shamon yes. here and uh we like for you to at least be blessed by uh, the knowledge that the lord has blessed this dear brother yes. with and uh, we are always uh, of course honored to have him with us 
and uh, we want to just take a full advantage of that. And I'll, I'll touch him for you. I'll get all Please. the barakat and all of the blessings for you. But nevertheless, <laughs> yeah. you go ahead and send the questions for now. Yeah. Until they come up with a question, let me know if you don't see one. Sure. Keep do going, this. brother. Yeah. Mar I'm going to look at two passages real quickly. Mark 7, 29 and 30. That shows that Jesus is omniscient and omnipresent, omnipotent. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark 7, 29 30. It's the story of the Syrophoenician woman telling Jesus that her daughter has been struck, struck by a demon. Right. Come and heal. Now. The woman's daughter is not physically present. She's away in her home at some great physical distance. Now notice Mark 7, 29 to 30. Many people don't even catch this. Mark 7, 29 to 30. Then he, then he said to her, Jesus said to her, For this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When she had come to her house, notice it's physically away, far away. She found the demon had gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So notice Al, the implication. Jesus is not physically there where her daughter is possessed by a demon physically at a great distance from where the daughter is that's he can right. tell her that's right go the demon has left now she's asking him to cast out the demon what are the implication that jesus not only knows the demon has left her but he's the one who cast out the demon from her without being physically by, present to by do his it. word just pronouncing it that they're out they're so left. you're saying in mark jesus is omnipotent omniscient omnipresent are you sure it's mark yeah mark 7 That's 29 30. no oh. <laughs> mark 7 29 30 so you wait 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 mark 7 29 30 jesus is physically in one location because as a man in his physical body he's one location but, he but knows as what's God, happening over there and now i know he's ordering the demon come out because she's coming to him to cast him out and he's saying he's already gone amen amen and, and by the way this is really my appeal to my Muslim friends I really beg of you to go and read these passages with an open heart and an open mind the Lord will open your heart and your mind amen. if you're sincerely seeking I was in your position one time but look where I'm at today amen. by the power of God the Holy Spirit by the power of the, of the gospel that saves my eyes have opened my heart has changed, and I can see clearly right now all of these powerful passages Hallelujah. about the glory of our yes. Lord. Let me give this final one, and maybe our time is up, I don't know, but Mark 9, 38, 39. Mark 9, 38, 39. These little hints there that are actually explicit to those who have eyes to see. John, Mark 9, 38, 39. John answered him, Teacher, we saw one who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can quick, quickly speak evil of me. Here's my challenge to all the anti-Trinitarians and Muslims. Show me a single passage in the entire Hebrew Scriptures, or even the Quran, where the name of a creature is invoked to do miracles, to heal and cast out evil spirits, which Muslims would say jinn. Quote an example where they're invoking the name of someone besides the true God to do miracles and cast out demons. You won't find it. This means that in Mark, Jesus must be God and his name possesses divine authority, an authority that cannot be ascribed to a creature without this being blasphemous. Amen. Amen. And we're getting ready to wrap up. So thank you for tuning in to Let Us Reason. Again, you can go to our website, sirainternational.com, and find that section, Let Us Reason, and listen to all of the previous podcasts, including this one. You can go for this special edition to our Facebook page, alfadi.sira, and watch this post on December 18th, 2019. We uh, really uh, prayerfully ask you to go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sira International, and become a Patreon patron, where you can give as little as $1, as much as the Lord put in your heart and I want you uh, brother yes. to tell them how they can do the same yes, thing yes my for patron you. patron account for now is uh, attached to my name Shamunian S H A M O U N I A N I may change it in the near future but for now it's Shamunian and any dollar amount counts because we're in full time ministry depending on the grace of God providing through servants and God bless you for supporting us and praying for us and loving us and pray for our families that Jesus will bless them abundantly. Amen. And of course, I mean, uh, we're doing this live before Christmas, so we want to wish all of you yes. a Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year's. Amen. And what a beautiful passage indeed that clearly states to us the deity of Christ other than Isaiah 9, 6, where it talks about who is this child that is born. He is the son that preexisted before his birth given to us. He is mighty God. And the list can go on and on and on. Amen. Until we meet again, have a blessed day.